I'm here with HR expert and consultant Tommy Smith as part of local enterprise event Retail Edge to ask some questions about employers' HR obligations. Okay, Tommy, new sick leave regulations were introduced on January 1st of 2023. Tell me about what this has introduced. So, as you said, Alison, for the first time, um, sick pay has been introduced as, uh, in the law. Employers have to now give sick pay to employees. So what happened was last year when it was introduced, it was three days of entitlement. This year it's five days. And in the next two years, it's going to seven and 10 days. So any employee who's with an employer for 13 weeks qualifies for this. And if they're absent, and if they provide a medical cert for an absence, the employer has to give 70% of that day's pay to the employee or 110 euro okay. as, as a cap. Let's say I'm a retail shop with two staff um, and myself running the business, will I have to introduce the Act and how will it apply for me and my staff? So basically every employer is obliged to comply with this, right? A lot of employers will already have an internal sick pay scheme they may operate, okay? Now, as with all things employment law, there's, uh, there's nuances, there's, there's depth to it, right? But in principle, if an employer already operates a sick pay scheme, that's pound for pound more beneficial than what the law has introduced, nothing needs to change they can deem that they're covered now already. Um, if an employer has never paid sick pay, then yes, even with two employees, once the qualifying criteria I just laid out are met, then those employees, when they're out sick, if they provide a medical cert, the, the employer would have to give a certain amount of sick pay to that employee. Do I have to give my staff a written contract? Yeah, so since 1994 in Ireland, there's been an obligation on employers to provide terms and conditions in writing to employees. All right. Now, again, you know, there can be different definitions of language and there can be depth to it, but that's the basic kind of um, scenario. So there have been some changes recently and employers may have heard the concept of a five day statement and then a main statement of terms. So, so right now where it's at is that within five days of an employee joining a company, a, a new job, they, the employer is obliged to give certain terms and conditions in writing. The employer then has 30 days to comply with the Terms of Employment Information Act and give a full statement in writing of terms and conditions. Right. Now, logically, Alison, most employers should just have a document that they have ready as the employee starts, mm -hmm. and then they don't have to worry about compliance. And what are some of the key things I should have in that contract so that I comply with the law? Yeah, so, so look, the, the law keeps it quite simple. All right. Um, I mean, it's the basic information an employee should really have about their new role. Okay. There's, there's 18 or 19 points. I won't go into every single one of them. They're readily available on places like the Workplace Relations website. Okay. But in reality, it's, the, it's you know, their own name, the name of the employer, because sometimes that can be a complicated, limited company name rather than a trading name. All right. Their location of work, their wage, the expectation of hours, any expectation on flexibility of hours or a band of hours, which may, may go up and down, right? Um, issues regarding notice um, that will be given to the employee or that the employee must give to the employer. Um, anything relating to pensions or sick pay are, are, are all on this list of about 18 nuggets of information that an employer is obliged to give in writing to their employees. What are the holiday entitlements, the basic holiday entitlements of a staff member? So, so in general, all right, for full-timers, it's four weeks um, annual leave per annum, all right? And, you know, part-timers, there's an expectation part-timers are treated fairly and compared to a, to a full-timer. So pro rata, it will all work out around that four weeks. So for some employees, it's calculated at a rate of 8% of hours worked, which again works out at in and around the, the four-week mark, all right? And obviously, if somebody joins during the year, right, their holidays are calculated on a pro rata basis. There's a little, little nuance though that if an employee works over 1,365 hours in a year, there's an automatic entitlement to four weeks. So let's say somebody might join a company in a February or March, right? But if they work full time, they will still reach that threshold. So even they have, they, though they have joined during a year, they would still build up the entitlement to four, four weeks holidays. Is there an easy way that an employer can calculate that entitlement if an employee starts mid-year, for example? Um, well, generally, it's the same system as I've just outlined, right? And to be fair, most of the progressive payroll systems should have built into them now a calculation system from that, all right? Um, if an in-person generally works part-time or ad hoc hours, it's 
quite safe to use the 8% rule. Obviously with full timers, what you're watching for is, are they gonna cross that 1365 during the year? If they do, it's four weeks. If not, it can be more on a pro rata basis. Let's say if a staff member was on sick leave, are they still entitled to time off for holidays for the sick leave period? They are now. So again, well, when I say it's a new employment law requirement, I think at this stage, time flies, doesn't it? So it's probably in eight or nine years now, right? So, so in previous years, no. If someone was out and they didn't work, they didn't build up holidays, even though they were on sick leave. That's, that's changed now. It started with a European court decision, which was brought back, into, brought back into Ireland. So yes, now when someone is out on sick leave, they do continue to accrue holidays, right? It's not, it's not indefinite. So for, if for whatever reason someone is, is maybe out on four or five years of sick leave, they don't have full entitlements built up, a cliff does appear at the far end, okay? So again, this is an area where guys like me can use complicated style of language, okay? But ultimately, holidays are accrued on sick leave and they remain available to an employee for 15 months after the end of the leave year in which they were accrued, right? A bit of a mouthful, right? But ultimately, if an employee is on quite long-term sick leave and then would maybe leave employment, right? It, it, depending on the timing of the year they would leave, it can be between five to kind of nine weeks is the maximum a employee could have if they've been on quite long-term sick leave. Tell me what I need to know about employing someone who's under the age of 18. Okay, so the first thing is you have to take this quite seriously because when it comes to any issue with an employee or possibly an inspection from um, an inspector of the Workplace Relations Commission, right, you know, two of the things that they're very, very hot on are work permits to making sure all is legal on that and, and under 18s, in essence, employing children, right? So uh, what I will say as well is there's a very, very useful poster on the Workplace Relations website, which really encapsulates into one sheet the most important information, all right? Um, so from a, a wage point of view, their, their under 18s can be paid 70% of the national minimum wage, all right? Um, but really, it's working hours and breaks t break times is where an employer has to really be clear on the specifics for under 18s, all right? So for, for, for adults, there's a certain break regime, all right, um, you know, a, a, a coffee style break after four and a half hours or a main meal break after six hours. But for, for, for children, for under 18s, it's different, right? They need a, a 30, uh, 30 minute break after four hours, okay? And, and they're kind of staggered as well for under 16s and 16 and 17 year olds, all right? And another key point, so break times is one, and another key point is, is finishing times, all right? Um, during term time, it's 10 p.m. with school the next day, all right? Um, on weekends or on holidays, an under 18 can work until, a 16 and 17 year old can work until 11 p.m., but they have to be out at 11 p.m. A lot of employers who might have certain clocking machines, clocking systems, you know, a, a worker may stop working at two or three minutes to 11, but if they don't clock out until five past, you've got to be very, very careful, all right, that you don't produce a record which shows somebody only leaving work at five past or 10 past, 10 or 11 at night. It's a really important point for employers to take on when, when it comes to under 18s. Tell me then about hiring someone who's 65, 66. What are my obligations in that regard? So, so obviously, as we're recording this, Alison, there's even um, a point in the news at the moment about um, the government considering legislation to, to outlaw retirement ages that are under the state pension age, all right? So for a couple of years, things like retirement and pensions have been kind of hot topics. There's been numerous legal cases where employers have tried to um, invoke, let's say, a contractual retirement age of 65, and it's been viewed to have been discriminatory, all right? So look, employers really have to look now that compared to generations ago, they always say things like 30 is the new 20, 40 is the new 30, all right? Well, 65 is the new 55. And we'd like to think that as we progress in age, because of lifestyle, because of health issues, you know, we're not, we would like to think we're still going to be young and sprightly at, at 65, touch wood, all right? So I think employers have to realise, right, that um, employees will probably want to work longer, all right? There's already a, work, uh, a workplace relations code of practice on, on extended working, and you can see the way the government introducing new pension reform later this year with auto enrolment, right, as well as this legislation I just mentioned, right, that, that really, you know, longer working is going to be expected now. And it's, it's a stark line, but if employers have in a contract of employment a retirement age of 65, they're as well now just really view that as unenforceable at this stage. Um, it's obviously somewhere to take legal advice or HR advice perhaps as, as people are approaching that, 
right? But I think also employers should look at you know, people who maybe have retired early or taken early retirement. Employers at the same time will give out about a lack of talent and a lack of ability to find people out there. Well, you have a cohort of possibly very experienced people who might look post-retirement at a second or third career. So there might be opportunities for employers there as well. Tell me where I can find some free information on some basic HR-related queries that I might have. Yeah, well, look, you know, the Workplace Relations website, workplacerelations.ie, it does have lots of publications, it has lots of guides, it has lots of useful templates for employers to, 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 to download and use, all right? Um, and it's probably underutilised by the employers of Ireland. I mean, obviously, at the same time, there's the likes of consultants like ourselves and, there, uh, and, and employment solicitors out there who are happy to give advice to employers. Not, not always free, of course, all right? Um, but there's plenty of information out there for employers to get. What areas are causing the most challenge for employers with staff at the moment? Um, there's a variety, okay? There really is. I mean, finding and retaining talent at the moment is a big issue, all right? We're nearly at full employment and I'm finding or I'm challenging clients who, who ring with these problems to really like look inside their four walls and find out what can they do to make themselves more attractive to, to talent, to maybe you know, reduce turnover or to, to, to make them um, get more applicants for roles, all right? Um, I think it compliance with legislation. If you look back kind of in terms of last year and this year, there's lots of little subtle changes coming into employment legislation. You know, it ranges from probation periods, exact wordings in contracts, new breastfeeding requirements, the right to request remote working, medical leave days, domestic violence, right? And, and, and the list goes on. There's at least 10 or 15. And to be fair to most employers, certainly in the SME sector, where there might not be a dedicated HR department, it's just keeping on top of all of these little changes that, that tends to come in every couple of months now, you know? And, and certainly don't look like they're going to particularly slow down anytime soon, all right? Um, I do think as a final point as well, maybe in a softer one, you know, leadership skills and management skills, all right? Um, I, I do think that, you know, as the generation of the workforce moves on, all right, um, and as Gen Z comes involved now, like how they're managed and their expectations of their leaders, of the people who, you know, as, as business owners, both you and your management team have to make sure you're ready to be the business and the leaders that will attract the future generations. Would that be the best way to mitigate against those concerns then? Would leadership and management be number one? It's a big thing, right? And, and sometimes with a certain cohort of employers, you know, it is hard to, 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 to talk to them about the more softer side of HR. You know, it's obviously easier to talk about some of the employment law kind of specifics we've already discussed now, right? But certainly employers have to reflect and look at things like their culture, their values, and their management team to make sure that everyone is harmonized kind of with one clear message and that it's a message that resonates with the demographic of, of, of work or that they're looking to bring into their business. What's the best way of building up loyalty so my staff will stay with me? So again, I'm, it, it's kind of hard and soft, right? The hard side of it is the nuts and bolts. You know, what, what wage are you offering? You know, is it competitive to your sector, but also is it competitive to your area to other people in your in your catchment area that you're going to be competing with, right? But again, maybe in, in terms of you know, I'm 19 years doing this now, and I think you know, back when I would have started, you know, the term of, of benefits, right, was for either multinationals or it was something you heard on American TV shows when they were talking about do you have dental or something like that, right? I think look, that's that's filtered down now, and all employers have to think about what other package options do they have for employees so beyond wage it's it's bonus it's the likes of employee assistance programs to help people who might be going through a tough period it's flexible working it's remote working it's um uh, vouchers you know it's gym memberships it's a service canteen it's what else can any employer i mean there's a there's a, a long list out there of course not everything will will work for every employer but certain employers have to make an effort and keep up with the Joneses in terms of their offering. So that's, you know, to build loyalty, you know, people have to maybe want to be there and be attracted to being there. But, but again, it does come back to the softer ones. It comes back to a culture and it comes back to, to values, right? And where I, I mean, I'm, I'm passionate about small employers in Ireland. That's, that's my bread and butter. That's who I've worked with for the whole time. And often what you'll find is they're an excellent workplace. 
They're an excellent employer to go in and learn as a student. You go into the local hardware shop, the local pub, the local, you know, kind of any type of retail shop. And you'll actually learn so much from the owner because you're working with them the whole time. There's a decent crew in there of long serves. But what you then is when you go on social media, or when you go online, all you're going to see is bigger businesses. And their HR department have cultivated these glossy brochures about how they are. So I think small employers certainly need to ensure that all the good stuff they're doing, all the stuff that's their USP that separates them from, from bigger business, that they've they magnify that as well. So you'll get people in and you'll develop this feel-good factor about working in the place. All right? And and a final a final kind of point I will say on that, right, is it's the light at the end of the tunnel comment, all right? Don't ever let someone stagnate. There should always be something that they can progress, be it training, be it a promotion, be it new experiences, be it a wage increase, all right? That there's always something there that they don't just, because if, if they're looking at the light at the end of the tunnel and they're progressing within their current employer, it might stop them looking left or right. Mm. Should I give my staff paid time for training? So, well, in short, yes, okay, and, and I went through a, a, some of the eclectic mix of, of different uh, law that changed, right? But, but actually mandatory training did, is part of the law now, all right? So certainly if there is any training that the employee must have to work with the employer. So look, the low hanging fruit on that would be stuff like manual handling training. It could be food safety training in certain businesses, forklift training, depending on, okay, different roles. Um, but the employer must pay for that now. All right, safe pass would be another example in, in, in the building industry. Now, the employer must pay for it, and also it must be conducted on the employer time. Okay, so gone are the days to kind of say, oh, go away and get your safe pass then and come on to site next week, all right? Um, but then beyond that, beyond the, 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 the basic of the law, look, absolutely. I mean, it's that age old saying, what if I train them and they leave? Yep, but what if you don't train them and they stay, all right? So every employer should certainly be looking at you know, developing skills, right? There's no point in giving out about someone's customer service skills or their inability to use certain machinery if you haven't actually shown them and trained them on how to do it, you know? Um, so to balance between internal training, it isn't all about absorbing cost and paying trainers or consultants to come in and do stuff. You can harness you know, a champion in each sector of your own business and, and ask them to be that person who, someone who's excellent at customer service, excellent at visual merchandising, Get them to be the standard bearer inside and write out the way they work things and then uh, spread it around to the whole team. Can I stipulate conditions for staff for refunding if they do undertake the training but then leave soon after? The short answer is yes, right? Um, I mean, obviously, you know, in terms of um, asking or demanding an employee would refund, you know, you're getting into a, a different area. You'd certainly want to have that stipulated very clearly in an agreement, all right? But of course, if you, you know, commit to um, putting a person through a certain course that's quite costly, right? Yeah, you can certainly say, look, if, if for whatever reason you drop out or if for whatever reason you um, leave within six months, a year, two years, okay, of obtaining this new qualification, I'm going to look for either a full or partial refund and we're all agreeing to that now and we're all going into that arrangement eyes wide open. Okay, what does equality in pay mean? Uh, look, it's an underlying expectation that there will be equal work for, for equal pay, all right? Um, I suppose in equality legislation in Ireland there are nine grounds for discrimination. So certainly where an employer would have to be careful is, you know, in terms of gender, sexual orientation, nationality, disability, marital status, family status, okay, and, 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 and all those. Certainly you'd want to be careful that for whatever reason, be it by design or by accident, people of a certain demographic doing a similar job have a different pay to other people, all right? I mean, obviously there are other reasons why people doing the same job may have a different wage rate, I mean, experience being one. It goes back to age-old pay scales, kind of, you know what I mean, be they in certain sectors or be they in, in unionised, you know, um, establishments where, you know, you reach a certain threshold of service, you move up a certain pay grade, right? But the underlying um, expectation is that there's no specific reason to do with any of the nine grounds why there would be a difference in rate, right? And, and, and look, there's, there's um, while you know, slightly different from equality of pay, right, there is gender pay gap reporting in Ireland now. All right, so for the last few years, it's been with organizations who've had 250 or more employees. That's filtering down now to 150 
um, or more employees this year and, and, and even progressing further next year, all right? So, so what's that? I mean, that's ultimately, you know, in essence, because again, it can be complicated language and it can be confusing for employers to read between the various things, but, but ultimately it looks at the distribution of genders in an organization, all right? So if for whatever reason you have 50-50 in terms of male and female, but predominantly one gender is in the, 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 the main bulk of workers and management are all another gender, you're gonna have a pretty big gender pay gap. So you have the same amount of, of workers, right? Whereas if you have, um, even if you have, let's say, in a senior level, you have you know, six men and, and two women, right? If they're paid a similar, a similar wage, you've very, you've, you, have a, you, you don't have any pay gap at that, at that level, right? So it's, it's a slightly nuanced one. Anybody who's caught in the plus 150 employees this year, certainly you know, the, the companies who prepare these reports for the last two years should have them on their website. So you can certainly get a bit of a head up in seeing how other companies have, uh, have constructed agenda pay reports. What is the minimum wage at the moment? It's it's twelve seventy at the moment in twenty twenty four. Um, obviously, the government have been uh, looking at this quite closely, and they're on a path to introducing a, a living wage, right? Which is um, which is benchmarked at sixty percent of the median wage, right? So obviously, it's moved in the last few years ten fifty to eleven thirty to twelve seventy. I suppose look, you know what happens at the end of this year, all right? may well depend on when there's a general election and what the political appetite is and where the economy is at and you know how, how employers have been, have, been, have been going on. But all being all, employers could well have to prepare for a further increase again at the end of the year if the government's plan, which they've stuck to for several years now already, is, um, is going to be executed. Um, now, um, as I, I would have mentioned earlier, that um, under 18s, can technically be paid 70% or can legally, let's say, be paid 70%, right? And also 18-year-olds can be paid 80% of the minimum wage and 19-year-olds can be paid 90%. But as with anything, Alison, that's supply and demand. You know what I mean? And, and in certain sectors, in certain markets, you know, good luck trying to get someone, you know, to work for, 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 for certain wages, you know? What does a probationary period give me as an employer? So, like, okay, uh, interview, you know, dare I use an analogy, like an interview ultimately is like a Tinder profile, all right? You know, you have a half an hour of someone on their best behavior. In essence, you, you, you swipe whether you feel you could work with this person or not, all right? The probation period, then you might liken it to the first few dates, all right? Look, I, I'm not making light of it, okay? It's, it's an important period, okay? And you have to be very fair to an employee, all right? But, but a probation period does give an employer an ability, right, to get a person in, to, to train them up, and really, really make an effort to train them up and really make an effort to give them all of the tools for success, all right? Um, and, you know, an employer really is, is, is obliged to set some reminders and not just drift off into life and then suddenly realize a couple of months later, oh yes, probate, okay, that's supposed to be organized, have feedback meetings, but a probation period does credibly give an employer an ability that if performance just isn't where it's at, if there's not a match of, you know, skills, it gives an employer an ability to maybe consider and say, look, this isn't working out, all right? I say that, and all of my clients will say, that's not what you say to us whenever we ring. So obviously there's a million questions and a million hurdles that employer has to be careful, okay? You can't simply wake up after six months and decide, hmm, Alison, will I or won't I, you know, and flip a coin on it. It has to be more structured. It's still a big deal, all right? Um, again, I mentioned the ever-expanding employment law or ever-changing employment law, probation was one that changed last year. So traditionally, an employer would usually say the probation period is X, perhaps three months, perhaps six months, but they might reserve the right to extend that if at their behest, really, all right? That's tightened up now, okay? Um, obviously, being on probation is a precarious enough position for an employee, okay? Certainly, if they're looking to get a of a mortgage or, or a loan, a bank isn't going to be particularly impressed to see they're on probation, right? So the pressure's on an employer now to set a period, a maximum of six months, and really use that time to, to meet with the employee, to encourage the employee, to give feedback, and ultimately make a decision as to whether that can be a long-term relationship or not. So legally, how long can I have a staff member on probationary period for? So it's six months, all right? But again, as with all things law, there's a slight asterisk in exceptional circumstances, that can possibly be extended. So for example, if someone you know, was unfortunately unwell for three or four months of the probation period, you could look at an extension, 
All right. Um, it's quite new legislation, so the, there's been a lot of opinions on what the exact definition of exceptional circumstances would be, but really it has to be well out of the ordinary okay, for an employer to extend, we'll say. All right? You have to work off the template that when someone starts, you, know, you set out in your contract, be it three, be it four, or, or, or a maximum of six, and, and, and just focus on doing all you can in that time to give yourself all the ammunition to make a decision. The Work-Life Balance and Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, that was brought into law in July of 2023. What will that introduce for employees? Yeah, so that's one of the, that's one of the again, the more, the more you know, blanket pieces of legislation that was brought in. So, I mean, one of the big ones in that is the, it formalises in law the right to request remote working. Right? Now, we're still waiting on the Workplace Relations Commission to publish its code of practice on that. It's due quite soon, right? which will obviously add more content to the, to the law and add, give more guidance to employers and, and employees on exactly what the expectations will be when requests are made. Um, it also introduced, for the first time in Ireland, five days of paid domestic violence leave. And just before Christmas, the government brought out a new template policy it would like employers to take and, and introduce um, into, into its own um, employment terms and conditions or handbooks. Okay? So again, in essence, that is that in the unfortunate circumstance that an employee, there is a domestic violence concern there, that an employee has the ability to, without losing pay, take some time to consult possibly the law, possibly Gardaí, possibly our solicitor, possibly seek medical support or something like that in a situation without running the risk of, of being down wages for that period. All right. Um, the work-life balance had also introduced enhanced breastfeeding rights. In reality, it enhanced. In reality, it introduced them. I mean, up to up to then, um, you know, mothers returning to the workforce had certain breastfeeding rights up to the age of the, the child was the age of six months, which in reality was when a woman would have returned from maternity leave in the first place. Now it's up to the age of two years. So if a woman is breastfeeding, they can seek a paid break from their employer for until the age of two of the child um, to either either leave work and feed the child or to have the child brought in um, or to express. So an employer would have to look at whether they can make an accommodation in their workplace of a secure, obviously discreet, confidential locked room and maybe some storage facilities um, should, a, should a mother want to store milk on site. Uh, what else is in the, the work-life balance? Well, there's also medical leave days, okay? So there's also leave days that look, it, it, it's for, it's for um, five days of unpaid so, so ultimately, an, uh, um, a carer or, or parent, right, if someone who's in the house with them needs, needs uh, for medical reasons, needs to be cared for, look, they, could, they could ring their employer and claim one of these five days. And obviously, if, if there's both parents involved or two guardians involved, they both get these days. Look, a lot of the time we are finding, if we think of this logically, you know, you know both parents work in a household now. Children get sick, <laughs> you know, if they get sick, they're not going to crash, they're not going to school perhaps, right? And it can be a very awkward for an employer, it can be very stressful for a parent to think, well, who's going to stay at home today? How are we going to, how are we going to juggle this, all right? And you may not want to involve people like grandparents or neighbours if the child is sick, they want to be with their parents. So, so instead of, you know, there being the temptation for the employer to, or the employee to have to ring in sick themselves or something, there's, at least now there's a focus of these medical leave days that they can, they can put a label on and say, look, I need to take one of these days. For the following reasons. Are they in addition to force majeure? They are, they are, um, and, and look it's good because force majeure is a, it's quite a high burden for force majeure, okay, and sometimes when I talk to employers about force majeure, a lot of the time the advice is serious in all the scenarios it may have been for an employee, right, it might not be force majeure. Now you very quickly move on to say look what can we do for the employee though, you know what I mean, in terms of an understanding. But force majeure, kind of, there's two pretty strong requirements, right? That um, it's a genuine reactionary emergency. Something has happened and drop of a hat, the focus of the employee needs to move to that, all right? And that the presence of the employee is indispensable, all right? So this is where you'd often find sometimes in force majeure uh, requests can be for two days. But even if you have a serious hospitalization of a family member on a pure technical point, you know, the force majeure scenario may apply for day one, but not for day two, right? But at the same time, like I said, most decent employers will still move on to a scenario where they'll give it as a holiday day or they'll look at time in lieu or they'll look at a, accommodating an employee in a certain way. How can I make sure then as an employer that I deliver those requirements, but still <laughs> I'm able to run my business within the tight deadlines that already exist? 
Yeah, look, it's, an, it's a huge administrative burden for employers, okay? Um, look, that being said, right, like, you know, you can set up a system, right, and certainly in, in all walks of life isn't the likes of a checklist or a to-do list system kind of, you know, works for people, okay? Um, this will be the same. Whenever someone starts, it would be great for an employer to have, you know, a list of 10, 15 things that they, 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 they get in place. All right, you know, from, from you know, I'd like to think even before employment, okay, even from the, the you know the the interview notes, all right, from from CVs, from any other references that are checked, onto any induction documentation that's put together, right, onto any contract and terms and conditions and compliance documentation that's given to the employee, all right, onto probation management and making sure you have dates in for meetings and feedback and onto general appraisals, you know, onto reminders on anniversary of service if things like wages have to be done. Like a lot of, the, a lot of that can, can be done, right? IT systems are very good now. A lot of employers have, um, maybe they have something like a timekeeping system or a payroll system, all right, or a roster system. But a lot of these systems now have multi-functions. They have the ability for you to be able to communicate and meet certain employment obligations or give employees access to certain folders, etc. on these ones now, all right? And look, and obviously, you know, consultants like ourselves, all right, um, we're available to, to be that helping hand or that big brother for especially the SME sector that don't quite have the need for their own internal HR resource, okay? So, like, it is, it is fiddly, all right? There are changes the whole times. Employers probably do need to be switched on maybe and set themselves a little reminder twice a year to just have a think about all HR and catch up on certain templates and update, you know what I mean, certain, certain policies, all right? But, but like all things, it's not impossible. Where there's a will, there's a way.